good afternoon and welcome to the last press conference of uh, EGU 23, which is the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. I'm Gillian D'Souza, EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I will in a very short time introduce our speakers for today. Uh, I would just like to share that the press conference will proceed in that each person will make their presentation for a few minutes, and we will then conclude with a common question and answer round towards the end for all of our speakers. So this press conference is titled, Wars Impact Oceans, Sands, and People. Our participants, our speakers for today are Edmund Mazer from University Hospital Kiel Institute of Toxicology, Germany, who is our virtual speaker and joining us online. Then we have Olivier Evra from the CNRSCEA. Um, LSCE, which is Climate and Environmental Sciences Laboratory, France, and then Florian Yin from the Alliance to Feed the Earth in Disasters, Delaware, US, and Justus Liebig University, Gießen, Germany. So we are ready to begin with Edmund as our first speaker. And once we have his slides ready, then over to you, Edmund. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And, and you can, can see, see my slides. slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my poster is named Toxicological Consequences of uh, Sea Dump Munition. And I'm uh, happy to share my results with you. So just as a bullet point, we have a new group of pollutants that is emerging in the world's oceans. So we already have to deal with microplastics, pesticides, and pharmaceuticals. But now we have a new one, and this is sea dump munition explosive chemicals as relics from the world wars. So the problem is that uh, we have millions of tons of corroding munitions worldwide, deriving after the World War II and after World War I already. And they are not only of harm because they can explode, but they also are of harm with regard to environmental damage because they are corroding and release the toxic chemicals into the marine environment. So this is a sketch showing that we have these munition items here as green balls on the seafloor lying. And we already know now that the toxic compounds TNT and other explosives leaking out of these munition uh, vessels. And they are to be found now in the sediment, in the pore water, in the water surrounding these items. And already we found them in the biota living there in the near. So the question is, where are these munition items derived from? So this was actions during war, for example. So the allies, they uh, performed lying uh, procedures to protect them from the Germans and the Germans in turn, they also performed uh, lying barriers in the Baltic Sea, for example. And it happens that today we have lying barriers from every nation being located in the border of the Baltic Sea. And these lying barriers are only sometimes uh, some uh, kilometers apart from each other. Other things are then sunken ships, which uh, have been attacked and which sunk, full of munition and full of fuel loaded, or we have shot down uh, uh, airplanes, or airplanes which drop the bombs into the Baltic Sea. And for instance, when the planes come home, um, they uh, just, and they didn't uh, reach their final destination, and they were fully loaded, they, prior to landing, released all the bombs into the sea because it was too dangerous to, to land on the Heim airport. But the most of these compounds derived from discarding after the wars. So after the war, there were much of munition compounds left or munition items left, and that were discarded in the, in the, in the Baltic and also in the North Sea. It was the easiest way to get rid of these harmful um, uh, things. So currently, we have a worldwide problem because the munition is distributed all over the world. So around Australia and the Pacific, west and east coast of uh, the United States, but the Northern Sea and the Baltic Sea are particularly affected because of the two world wars. So uh, in our approach, we just uh, did the following. We performed a so-called biomonitoring with blue muscles. So the left side, upper left side shows you the Kohlberger Heide near Kielport. And in this area, we have a major dumping site for munition items from the Second World War. 
And these balls represent mines that are in diameter one meter, and each of these balls contains 200 to 300 kilogram of, um, of TNT. So we constructed a mooring. The mooring is shown on the right side. It's like an anchor with lifting bodies. And there we put mussels from, un, uh, uh, from, from uh, fresh areas. So they, they were not burdened with any munition. So they were from, um, area, from areas without dumping munition. And we, with the help of divers, we positioned these mussels near the mines, which are shown there. And after three months, we recollected the muscle stem, put them into the lab, and then we performed an, an analysis on very sensitive machines. And we could then measure this TNT and all the metabolites of TNT and derivatives thereof. So this shows through just the sketch. We did, uh, we performed several scenarios. So the first scenario is just to having this mooring in the near of a corroding mine. On the left side, you see the, corro the corroding mine, and then you see the muscle bags there. And after three months, we collected these muscles and we just did then the toxicological risk assessment. So we found that from the viewpoint of a human seafood consumer, these muscles can still be eaten. However, the muscles themselves, they show health effect, which we could show with a molecular biomarker that these muscles suffer from oxidative stress. The second scenario was performed in an area where we had three line chunks of TNT. So these are not anymore covered with metal shells, but these are free. And the problem is that we have a much higher entry of TNT and this toxic explosive stuff into the nearby uh, uh, muscles. And the toxicological risk assessment showed us that the consum consuming muscles from this area bears the carcinogenic risk for the human seafood consumer. However, from, we have another problem, and this problem is from the marine ecology. So if I was a fish, I would not place my eggs there on the surface of the seafloor or in the free water. I instead would place my eggs then in clefts and in other holes, and the corroding mines are ideal places just to put the eggs there and to raise the larvae. And we know that the larvae are very sensitive to even low concentrations of these munition compounds. They do not reproduce and they do not grow and they do not develop. And this brings me to the North Sea. We have in the North Sea more than 10,000 shipwrecks and 500 of them are loaded with munition, both from the First World War or from the Second World War. Just some examples. We have very big cruisers, but we also have smaller fishing boats or submarines. So I'd like to focus attention on the John Mann on the lower left side. The John Mann was a fishing boat which was, conf which was confiscated by the Nazis. And the Nazis armed this one with anti-aircraft guns and water bombs. Now we have the situation that in 49, the John Mann was sunk by an aircraft attack. It is now corroding on the seafloor, which you see on the, in the middle lower uh, uh, area. And we know that the TNT and all the metabolites thereof, which are carcinogenic, toxic, uh, uh, leak out the munition items there. And we could find all these munition items then in shells, in fish, in the sediment, in water. And what we are doing now is we are performing a toxicological risk assessment insofar as the human seafood consumer is concerned. And when it comes to the marine environment, we already found in fish a higher incidence of tumors, of liver tumors, which unequivocally is uh, the reason because of the exposure to this munition. So I come to the conclusion. So these explosives from dumped munitions or from shipwrecks, they are toxic and carcinogenic. And we have currently no acute risk for the human seafood consumer. But these explosives, and danger already now, the marine ecology and the marine diversity. And in principle, they may also enter the marine food chain once the corrosion continues. And this is the problem. So another point is, as has been done until now, uh, to get rid of these munition items, they were placed in places there where they were in the sea floor. But we could show that this increases the problem with the uh, distribution of these munition compounds in the marine biota. So in our, uh, our eyes, the recovery of dump munitions should begin immediately. 
And when it comes to the shipwrecks, the shipwrecks is of course uh, another story because it's very difficult to remediate shipwrecks, but one could do a priority list and uh, to monitor the ships and make just a list where we should start with the remediation. And this remediation regarding munitions and fuel cargo should be considered. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Edmund. We will now move on to our next speaker, Olivier. So just give us a minute for your slides to load and then you can begin. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, so I will show you how we try to answer this question to know whether the cesium-137, a radioactive, an artificial radioactive substance contained in sarin dust, uh, which deposited across Europe uh, last spring in 2022, whether it was emitted by a French nuclear test in Algeria. And to answer these questions, we worked with uh, different uh, research teams from France, Switzerland, and Spain. So actually, uh, there have been several um, significant dust episodes recently, and uh, including uh, in February 2021 and in February 2022, February and March 2022, uh, with significant um, deposition of dust across several countries in Western Europe. And um, actually, in both 2021 and 2022, there is at least one association who collected one single dust sample and uh, analyzed it and found this uh, artificial radioactive substance, cesium-137, in the dust deposits. And so it made the headlines in several European media um, in uh, these two years. Uh, and as this radioactive substance contained in sarin dust uh, was found, they attributed it to uh, the French nuclear tests that were conducted in uh, the Sahara before Algeria became independent in the early 60s. Um, but actually, um, we thought that it would be beneficial to have more than one single uh, sample uh, to, re to, to conclude this. And so what we did together we, uh, with a, um, a Spanish colleague, Germán Orizuabla, uh, on Twitter, uh, we launched a participatory campaign to ask uh, people collecting uh, dust. And in 2022, actually, the, the, the deposits were quite dense. So uh, we it, it was for... It was quite fruitful, actually, as we could collect more than 100 samples across uh, different uh, regions of Western Europe, uh, many from Spain and France, different locations, but also some samples from Belgium, the Lux Luxembourg, and Austria. And so now we are compiling a, a database that we want to make um, available open access, um, resulting from this participatory campaign. But of course, it takes some time uh, to, to analyze these samples. And um, we want to answer this question by measuring various properties, um, including the color of dust, the, its content in diff different chemical elements, and so on. So based on these multiple analyses, what we could um, show is that we have quite uh, homogeneous, or even very homogeneous samples uh, in most of the regions except in Austria. And we think it's because uh, the Austrian samples were collected um, with a significant snow cover and that probably different uh, dust from different origins were mixed, which was not the case uh, typically in Spain and in France. Um, we could show indeed that the color and the mineralogy of the, the, the dust samples uh, were consistent with those uh, soils and rocks you, found, you find in the region of the Algerian Sahara where France did conduct uh, nuclear tests. So it's consistent in that way. And we did find uh, radioactive cesium-107 in all uh, the dust samples that we uh, obtained. But that said, can we conclude that uh, this cesium is, attribute, it is attributable to uh, the French tests? 
Actually, we do think that's uh, very likely not. Why? Because uh, so cesium was produced by all the nuclear atmospheric tests that were conducted around the world. Uh, and that if you look at the map on the left, um, you see uh, the different location where nuclear atmospheric tests were conducted around the world, along with the power of these tests. And you see that the uh, uh, major tests uh, sites were operated by the USA and by the Soviet Union, including at uh, latitudes where uh, the SARA is located. And once it's emitted uh, into the atmosphere, uh, it will disperse following the general air circulation and then deposit with rainfall. Um, so to answer um, the question, what we can do as well is to look at another uh, artificial radioactive substance that's been emitted by the nuclear tests, which is plutonium. Because plutonium, depending on its signature, uh, can tell you whether uh, it comes from typically U.S. tests or French tests, because basically they use different technologies and recipes to construct their bombs. So typically, um, the global fallout signature, which is in red on the graph on the right, uh, which is largely dominated by the U.S. and the Soviet Union tests, uh, was the signature we found in all uh, the selection of dust samples we analyzed across Europe. Whereas uh, the French, the expected French signature, the French bomb signature would be uh, the blue stripe you see on the graph and none of the dust sample had a uh, similar uh, signature. So to answer this question, uh, we could obtain, thanks to the, uh, this participatory campaign, more than 100 samples, which give us uh, uh, a basis with a, a representative spatial uh, extent to answer a question of large interest. And we could show that uh, the signature of the radioactive fallout was quite valuable uh, to identify without any ambiguity the source of this fallout. And actually it was uh, useful in, to answer this question, but it's also useful to answer other research questions, uh, including to make the difference between the radioactive fallout due to the global uh, fallout associated with the nuclear atmospheric test, but also typically accidental fallout like the Chernobyl, so we can make the difference between Chernobyl and global fallout, or uh, discriminate the specific emissions uh, produced by the uh, nuclear accident in Fukushima. And also because um, like France after uh, uh, the independence of Algeria, they moved for their other, for the next nuclear test to French Polynesia in the Pacific Ocean. And they, they conducted their test later uh, which is quite useful because there was associated fallout with a distinct signature to date, like uh, sediment and environmental archives uh, in South America, uh, where many land use, deforestation, and other processes have been taking place during the same period, which help us to reconstruct the impacts on those changes on uh, environmental processes. And this would be the end of my presentation. Thank you, Olivier. Now we will hear from our final speaker, Florian, in a few minutes. All right. Uh, hi, uh, I'm, work, working, I'm coming here to you as a senior scientist from the Alliance to Beat the Earth and Disasters. If you want to get into contact after the call, uh, you can connect with us by just following the link you can see here or writing me in mail. So, at Offit, we are looking at what we can do to feed people in extreme situations. And one of those extreme situations is nuclear war, which has come back to all of our minds due to the invasion of Ukraine. However, when we discussing nuclear war, we often talk about the radiation and the explosions. However, it is likely that the most dire effect from a nuclear war is the nuclear winter that could happen after that. In a nuclear winter, the global temperature could drop up to 10 degrees. And also the precipitation would change, global ocean currents would change. All this in combination would lead to, would likely lead to a massive shortfall in food production. There is a study by Xia et al where they simulated this and they came up with up to 90% loss of food production. Um, at Alfred, we want to see what could be done instead. So what kind of resilient food solutions, those food solutions that could also work in such scenario could be used to uh, mitigate the losses 
fought on to by a nuclear war. One of those foods is seaweed. You might be wondering why seaweed? Seaweed can grow just extremely fast, so up to 30% per day. It also can be grown in a low-tech environment. So what you can see on the pictures here are uh, actual seaweed farming today, which can be done quite low-tech. And also we know that seaweed can be grown today and we can use it for food production in the future because we're using it for food production now. What we did was we used nuclear winter data and uh, modeled the seaweed growth globally after the nuclear war and also how quickly we could scale up the global production. The first key result I want to share with you is this global map which shows where seaweed can still be grown in a nuclear winter. The dark green is the very suitable areas, light green is somewhat suitable, and blue is unsuitable. As you can see, there are still considerably large areas after nuclear war where we can grow, still grow seaweed. Also, many of those areas are located in places where we're already growing seaweed today, like for example, Indonesia. The second key result I want to share with you is how the growth of seaweed develops over time in a nuclear winter. The figure you see here shows the median daily growth rate for the seaweed over the first 10 years after the nuclear war. The color indicates the severity of the war, so the darker the color, the more severe the nuclear war was. As you can see, you have a peak of the growth rate in the first year, in the first few years, and also for the more severe nuclear winters, which might seem counterintuitive, but the explanation is actually quite straightforward. The uh, seaweed, um, the nuclear winter disrupts global ocean currents. Those disrupted global ocean currents lead to the upwelling of nutrients in the oceans. And the more the severe the nuclear war was, the more uh, the larger the upwelling becomes. For the seaweed, the limiting factor for growth is often not the amount of temperature or light available, but the nutrients. And so if you have a nuclear winter where more nutrients are brought to the surface, you also have more seaweed growth. The third key result I want to share with you is the uh, how quickly the seaweed can be scaled up. Um, we use as a comparison case the production of airplanes by the US in the Second World War. And our model shows that we could produce after only seven months an equivalent of 70% of the global human food demand in seaweed. It does not mean that we want to feed uh, everyone 70% seaweed, but uh, the seaweed can also be used as feed for animals and also for biofuel production, which will also be important in the nuclear winter. <clears throat> All this can be done in an area roughly the size of Lithuania. So it isn't actually that large in a global comparison. The implications um, to really manage to get this going, we would need to establish infrastructure beforehand. Like for example, at places where we're already producing seaweed, uh, we could also uh, have their hatcheries where we provide additional species that could work in nuclear winter. It would also be good if uh, we could look at more species because this study was done with only one kind of seaweed. The next thing is uh, seaweed often contains iodine and the amount of iodine is actually what limits how many seaweed people can eat. If we would have seaweed species or techniques that remove the iodine from the seaweed, we could also eat more seaweed. Finally, seaweed is just a good idea in general because it could improve food security now. So for example, the FAO uh, regularly calls for more seaweed use to improve food security. It 
there has also been research going on how we could use seaweed as a uh, way to combat climate change because we can sequester carbon from the atmosphere with it. So, and then the combination with the added, added civilizational resilience in nuclear winter, seaweed is a really good deal. And to conclude, <clears throat> we have shown that there is a high potential for seaweed to improve the food security in nuclear winter. And there are also large areas available where you can grow the seaweed. And this in combination shows that seaweed could help avoid a global famine in a nuclear war. Thank you for your time. Uh, again, uh, if you want to connect, you can do so by the link or by just writing an email. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all of our speakers for today. We now move to the next and the final part of our press conference, which is the question and answer round. So I open the floor to questions from journalists in the room and those joining us online. Um, and if you have speaker uh, questions for our virtual speakers, well, we have Edmund ready to answer. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question. Hello, I'm uh, Javier Barbosan, I'm a freelance journalist. I have a question for Olivier. Uh, so your conclusion is that the um, decision that is present in the, in the Sahara is not coming from the French nuclear test, more from the global fallout, right? Uh, so that means that anywhere in the world we're getting the same amount of fallout or it gets worse in the sun episodes. And then is this level of radiation uh, so the first is uh, about the amount, so if, if it goes, gets worse after we have episodes of, of Saharan dust. And the second is, is this level of radiation uh, bad for the health or for the environment? Thank you. Okay, um, so you will find cesium in any, almost any soil in the world because there has been fallout uh, everywhere. Um, Depending on the level, actually, uh, the cesium, it will bind to the finest uh, mineral particles, typically clay. And so the what happens with a, a sarin dust episode is that um, you will have a selection of those uh, finest particles that will travel uh, the farthest from the source. So typically with the, the sample set we analyzed, we saw that the dust that deposited in France uh, is finer and richer in cesium than the dust deposited in Spain. Um, and given the, the, so you have an enrichment, but still it remains quite low uh, and I would say unharmful. So uh, if you go to the Sahara and sample the, the dust directly from the desert, it's even low concentration, I guess, right? Well, I guess it depends on the place where uh, you collect the dust. Uh, so we, we tried to, to um, find different ways of getting back to the source. Uh, and actually, there are lots of scientists doing this for paleoclimatology studies. And so we have different types of rocks uh, and so different signatures. And in terms of cesium, actually, we have uh, information about the latitudinal distribution, but we don't have detailed maps. So maybe there are zones with higher uh, concentrations. We don't know. This remains to be uh, investigated. I guess. Thank you. Okay, we have another question coming in. Just a minute. Hi, I'm Teresa from the EGU press comms team. And I have a question for Florian. Might be a bit of a silly question, but how do you measure the severity of the nuclear winter? I saw that you indicated it with a TG in your graph. So what does that TG mean and how do you how do you model the severity? Okay, yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't explain that. So uh, the TG is, is for terograms and this refers to the amount of black carbon that was emitted to the atmosphere because the nuclear war is caused by the burning of the cities when they go up in flames. And this is just a measure of how much black carbon emits into the atmosphere. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? We don't seem to have any questions from anyone online either. 
So if we are good, okay, then we can conclude this press conference. So thank you once again to our speakers for joining us today, uh, virtual speaker, as well as those in the room. Um, if anyone has any questions to ask them or if you'd like to request an interview, then you can definitely reach out to me and we will put you in touch with the speakers. So thank you again for joining us today. This was the last press conference of EGU 23 and I wish you all a very successful conclusion to the conference week. Thank you. <laughs>